Our scripture reading today is from the book of Romans. It's one of my favorites, and it's in the fifth chapter. As a high schooler, I ran cross country, and if you know anything about cross country runners, we're all a little crazy. Um, and this one is about suffering and endurance, it's, so it's one I've honestly probably had memorized since my teen years. Um, so let's hear it today from the chapter, fifth chapter, starting in the first verse. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Let's pray. God, thank you for these words of Paul, for their encouragement in the midst of suffering, and for the endurance and character and hope it leaves us with. We pray that the scripture fall new upon fresh and open ears, and that you instill hope in each of us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At the Simply Smiles Community Center on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation in the middle of nowhere, South Dakota, a summer day camp filled of kids living in poverty is run using volunteers from places like us, places from Ann Arbor. We trek in and we try to engage and entertain these kids who have grown up in a culture and a world that is unlike anything that our kids have lived through. Small children flock toward these camp vans that pull up in their neighborhoods, and they come out of houses and trailers that house 10 or 15 people, many of whom deal with addiction or alcoholism or unemployment. We pull in and their front lawns are overgrown and filled with broken down cars or machinery. Litter is everywhere and little tykes, toys, and various levels of broken are scattered about. Their parents and guardians are trying to do the best they can at a system of racial discrimination and poverty, addiction and unemployment that is systemic from generations before. They're working to protect a people and a history and a land from extinction, despite some of our nation's best attempts otherwise. It's a few place, it's a place few would want to travel to beyond driving through and subsequently few do. And yet it is here a little boy named Ethan that I found an enduring story of hope. Here's a picture of Ethan. He's about uh, 20 months. He wears a bandana every day that we saw him, and he has beautiful hair that his mom keeps long because that's what's traditional for Lakota men, even little men. <laughs> his mom, the woman who feeds him, clothes him, changes diapers and chases him around, is not his biological mom. But as someone who's adopted, I know that blood doesn't make someone your baby. Ethan's mom was in the final stages of adopting him, but the legal fees make that process unattainable for her, so she is resigned to be his guardian as her legal title. See, his mom is already a mom to three older kids. Two now, she lost her eldest to suicide just a year ago. But her 17-year-old daughter is being scouted for a basketball scholarship on the East Coast. Basketball is the sport on reservations. So I sat and she spoke nervously to me, as any mom would, sending their child across the country to go to school. She's in her 40s, but she looks like she's lived far more life than 40 years. We settle in these paint-chipped picnic tables and talk while Ethan is chased and doted on by a handful of our teenagers. She tells me she had her first kid at 15, and she recounted how she used to get up at 5 a.m. every day she would take her mom to work in their one family car, and she would come home and get her younger siblings and her baby boy ready for the day. She would pack lunches and get them out the door, dropping her son off at daycare, her siblings off at school, and then taking herself to school. After school, she would go to an after school job, pick everybody up, come home, cook dinner, and at nine, when her mother finished her second shift of her second job, she would go pick up her mom, come back home, 
and do it all over again the next day. She vowed at that time that she would find a husband who would help in some way, and for a while she did. But uh, the, the alcohol intake of his turned into addiction and turned into abuse, and she said when he hit her in front of her children, that was the turning point. She told me, you don't disrespect me in front of my kids. And so she kicked him out, and a year later, he drank himself to death, leaving her again with no support. So when her teenage daughter brought home a friend who at 15 found herself pregnant, she knew the story all too well. The substance abuse started during pregnancy and didn't improve much after, and so she began to watch Ethan as an infant and then finally gained court recognition as a guardian. Just as she was to launch her youngest of her children into a bright future, she's raising a two-year-old. But she tells me, with a sparkle in her eye, of the outfit she is preparing for his very first powwow, of the intricate beating her and her friends make for Ethan's moccasins and pants. He will be raised with a perseverance and an endurance of a single mom who at 40 has weathered more adversity than most of us in a lifetime. And he will be raised with the pride and the history and the tradition of the Lakota people. She has no reason to believe that her children and her story would turn out any different than the tragic lives of those around her, but instead she clung to hope. And she dug in her heels and she believed in a future for her children that she could not yet see. And when other parents couldn't hold on to hope, she held on to it for them, caring for children she did not bear because she believed that her people can and will endure. As she told this story, Ethan gleefully chased this basketball that was bigger than his whole torso and grinned this new tooth grin and flirted with Abby, who is shown here, who, by the way, is going to Wisconsin right now, chasing a career in psychology to help underprivileged children. His joy brings me hope. His mom's commitment brings hope. Abby's career path brings hope. Their story, though wrought with tragedy and suffering, is really a story of hope. And Paul's writing in the fifth chapter of Romans speaks right to the heart of a story like Ethan's, because it speaks of suffering and endurance and perseverance and hope. It's a passage about resilience. It's a passage about faith. And in it, Paul doesn't attribute the suffering to God, as if God has no other methods to teach us about endurance other than to throw hurdles of suffering at us. Our God is far more creative and capable and loving than that. Instead, Paul just lays it out. Look, suffering is going to happen, and when it does, you're going to gain character and endurance and hope. And so Paul uses our all too human experience of suffering to teach us what hope is really all about. We hope, Paul writes, in sharing in the glory of God. We're going to spend a little couple minutes on that phrase, in the glory of God, because some have understood this phrase to be uh, a phrase about, about the heavenly kingdom of God, the life after this earthly one. But the text doesn't really say that explicitly. And this is always one of the, the mysteries of me, of our faith. Every year in confirmation, the, the eighth graders will just blast me with questions about heaven and hell and afterlife. And I really don't know how to answer them because truthfully, our scripture says very little about the afterlife, about heaven. Our faith has, a, has spent a lot of energy on it, right? What it looks like, who gets in, how you get in. But truly, our scriptures uh, speak, speak little about it. And, and so it's this mystery. There's a best-selling children's book on heaven. Um, I'm not going to give you the title or the author because, frankly, I don't really like it. But <laughs> its pages are filled with the following content, and I think it describes probably our, our idea or our culture's idea of heaven. Heaven is somewhere you believe in. It's a beautiful place where you can sit on soft clouds and talk to other people who are there. At night, you can sit next to the stars, which are the brightest of anywhere in the universe. If you're good throughout your life, then you get to go to heaven. When your life is finished here on earth, God sends angels down to take you up to heaven to be with him. 
This book was written for children, and somebody who works with grieving children sent this book to uh, one of my favorite theologians, N.T. Wright. And with the book came a note that said, I hope you find this awful book helpful in what not to say. No mincing of words there. Well, uh, N.T. Wright obviously did find it helpful because he wrote an entirely new publication about uh, hope. And in it, he includes these words from this children's book because he said this really explains our current state of confusion about hope and hope in the afterlife. And what he suggests is that we basically sell ourselves short as Christians when we place our hope in this idealistic, cloud-hopping, angel-flying heaven rather than the authentic hope that's the result of the Easter promise. And Easter is really what our faith is all about. I know Christmas has taken the center stage in our cultural celebration of our faith, but really without Easter, we would have nothing to celebrate. If our hope was supposed to be about this cloud-hopping version of heaven, then we just sit with each other and stargaze at night, then Jesus would have no reason to come back from the dead and come to earth. It would have been a one-way ticket to heaven and forget this unredeemable low place called earth. But Jesus was resurrected to come back to earth to give us hope that this kingdom of God that, that is eternal but is also meant for the here and now will happen. It's about the two, heaven and earth, coming together as one. Our hope is not built on this plane waiting for a one-way ticket to go up there. Our hope is the merger of heaven and earth colliding in the here and now. And we get to see all that is to come, the, the things that are shrouded right now by, by darkness and grief and despair. Those will not have the final, final word, but rather in this merger, light and love and hope will. That's, that's the kind of hope Paul speaks of when he says we hope in sharing in the glory of God. Sadly, hope too often gets misconstrued as weakness. How many of you heard if, if someone's really hopeful, they're like, ugh, just really naive, they're just really not grounded in reality. A social worker friend told me uh, that they have a name for first-year graduates out of MSW programs, and they, they call them green to indicate their, uh, their newness, their fragility, their kind of hopefulness. He said, as you put years in the field, you get more of a badge of honor. But he admitted it was a badge mostly made of calluses. A badge undoubtedly built by stories that are far unlike Ethan's, but perhaps more common. Because for every story like Ethan, there's a story like Miggy. Miggy is a little boy whose mom came to the reservation mostly to hide from CPS who wanted her arrested and her kids taken away. But because of how the reservation's legal enforcements differ from our federal enforcements, she was offered a bit of protection there. She could hide, so to speak. Mickey's mom uses meth on a regular basis. She grows it or makes it and deals it, and all of her addiction takes her time and money and focus away from her three boys that she has nothing left for. And they presented themselves at camp with so many signs of need and neglect and instability that all of our hearts were shattered into a million pieces. Miggy, age seven, uh, witnessed or was the recipient, we couldn't quite figure it out, of a, a really violent set of events one of the nights during his weeks at camp. And they had to pull in our teenage kids to question them about the stories that Miggy was telling them. Fortunately, they were able to get CPS from the reservation to intervene for Miggy, but we never heard the end of how that story turned out. With stories like Miggy and these staggering statistics of poverty and suicide rates and alcoholism and unemployment, that's life on the reservation, these organizations that we served with, like Simply Smiles, are met with comments all the time of disillusionment. People tell them, why do you even try? What you're doing won't make a difference. They're a bunch of drunks. They're never going to change. Just pack up and move on. I really don't know how you can say things like that and still believe in Jesus. Because taking a stance of defeat and believing in a world that is harsh and cruel and without redemption is saying that hope has no role for you in your life. 
that Jesus' death and resurrection have no meaning for you or for the world around you because Jesus' name, by definition, is hope with a capital H. You cannot be beaten and ridiculed, mocked and murdered by a world and a people you love, then rise from the dead, forgive them, and still believe and preach in redemption and in a kingdom that is to come and not be the definition of hope. Hope, my friends, is not only a Christian virtue, it is a tenet of our faith. It is a belief in the very beings and actions and mystery of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. I do not believe that hopeful is the same as naive. I believe it is the same as faithful. It is a conscious choice to believe it will get better, and the founding of that belief is in something far deeper. I don't know what hope looks like for you. Maybe you have a picture like, like this of Ethan and Abby that represent hope and redemption and future change. Or, or maybe you have a person in your life or a book or a Bible verse or a church or community. But if you don't have that, open your eyes and find it. Because I promise you that Jesus has left his fingerprints and they are fingerprints of hope all over this world. And this world is not cruel and harsh and headed for dismal destruction. It is one that has the capability and promise to be redeemed into the kingdom of heaven that is not only beyond, but that is here and now, a merger of the two. That future merger promise is what we all ultimately hope for. And yet we live in a time and place that will leave you throwing up your hands in exasperation and exhaustion with every latest news story or hurricane or typhoon or death or diagnosis, it's like we really want to say, what next? What now? But hope gives us a different narrative. So if you're throwing up your hands and you're asking God what next, the answer is that you dig deep. You dig your heels into the foundation of our faith into that beautiful dirt that God created to grow and cultivate good. And you refuse to go down that foxhole that pins this world as beyond redemption. And if you're asking what now, the answer is that you find and you define hope. And rather than look for and retell the stories of kids like Miggy, look for and retell the stories of Ethan and of organizations like Simply Smiles who stubbornly cling to hope. There are two narratives from which you can choose. As a follower of Christ, Choose hope, live it, speak it, see it and share it. Choose hope because Paul's promise rings true and hope does not disappoint us. Amen.